I think one of the things that makes myth really interesting to me is the way that it's um, a kind of form of communication that uh, people can use to to discuss ideas with one another, but then also it, it kind of changes between Greece and Rome. So um, my most recent book was looking at myth in the Roman world, um, particularly in sort of houses and villas and on funerary art, places like that. But actually, if you look in the Greek world as well, you find that myths appear more or less everywhere on things like temples, sacred architecture, um, on vases, of course, as well, um, and then later on in forms of sculpture um, too. Um, and I think that myth kind of gives people a common language to um, communicate with one another because everybody knows myths. But then on the other hand, they're also flexible enough to kind of tweak them and make them relevant to your particular area or, or to, to what you want them to say. Um, so thinking about some of, some of the ways that we might um, see that, if you think about temples, for example, um, you often find mythological scenes shown in pediment sculpture and metopis. Um, and partly they're there to praise the deity that the temples um, on a, in honour of. So um, on the Parthenon we've got the birth of Athena, on the Pediments um, we've got the struggle over um, the control of Attica. Um, those are obviously there partly to uh, celebrate Athena, who's the, 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 the deity who's kind of housed within this, this temple. Um, and you see that also in places like um, uh, the Temple of Zeus, for example, at Olympia. But we can also see myth being used to kind of say something about um, the, the, the city that the temple is um, positioned within as well and the community that it serves. So if we think about, again, about the Parthenon, you have um, the mythological scenes on the metopes used as a kind of allegory or metaphor for um, the Greek um, defeat of the barbarians, the Persians in this case, um, not through showing those scenes, not to actually showing scenes of Greeks against the Persians, but through showing mythological kind of um, parallels for those. So myth can be used then as a sort of form of metaphor to talk about other things, political events particularly. Um, and that's something that you see carrying on elsewhere as well. So if we think about the, the Hellenistic period um, and the Gigantomachy relief, which goes around the outside of the Great Altar of Pergamon, which is now yeah. Berlin Museum, um, then, yeah, we've got uh, a Gigantomachy, so the scene of the Battle Against the Giants, a very key theme that reappears in lots of sacred architecture. Um, but also it's being used as a kind of uh, a metaphor for the battles of the Attalids against the Gauls, so to commemorate their victories. Um, but at the same time, because this Gigantomachy is a very detailed one, it's got all the names of the different giants and the gods um, in, added on in inscriptions, um, it's got kind of the, the placement of the figures around um, the monument, it seems to be quite carefully organised. Um, it's also a very kind of scholarly monument, it asks you to think about kind of um, what research is going on into Greek mythology at the time that the Attalids are, are promoting. So it kind of serves lots of different, um, yeah, lots of, lots of different needs and kind of self-representation. Yes. The Greek Antomachy is on one of the sides of the uh -huh. Parthenon, the Metope is there, and also on Athena's shield as well. So um, according to reports and, and also um, the copies of the Athena Parthenos. So yes, so it is this, um, it kind of picks up, and actually the Attalids um, later on in the Hellenistic period set up their own version of um, a series of, uh, of kind of mythological battles, so including the Gigantomachy, the battle against the giants, and then the battle against the Amazons, which also uh -huh. appears on the Parthenon Metopis, but then adding the battles against the Persians and the battles against the Gauls. So they kind of almost <laughs> create a, um, a sort of a history. So you start off with what's happening on the Parthenon and then you carry on into the Hellenistic period uh -huh. Metopis, yeah. which is quite nice. A little bit. Um, you find under Augustus, for example, um, that uh, the uh, Temple of Apollo on the Palatine has um, terracotta uh, plaques with the um, rivalry between Hercules and Apollo for the control of the Delphic tripod. And that's seen as a kind of um, 
an allusion to the battles between Octavian and Mark Antony because Octavian modelled himself on Apollo and Mark Antony modelled himself on Heracles and also Dionysus. So this, their myths sort of being used as a kind of coded way. But generally the Romans were more into putting historical scenes um, mm. on temple friezes. So you get often um, scenes of sacrifice and processions. They tend to be more into kind of real scenes than, than mythological scenes. In, in Rome you find myth I think the main places that you see it, you do see it in public, but it tends to be more in the form of kind of statues and paintings that have been taken from Greece and put on public display uh -huh. in in Rome. Um, or you find it in paintings and mosaics in, in the domestic sphere. Yeah. And the Temple of Zeus at Olympia is really interesting because you've got you've got the battle or the chariot race between Pelops and Onimaeus on the pediment with Zeus at the centre of it, so kind of overseeing that battle. Um, but then you've got the, the Lapis and the Centaurs on the other mm. end, um, which isn't obviously very closely connected. Um, but you've also got the labours of Hercules, yeah. or Heracles on the Metapis, and there, I mean, Heracles is the son of Zeus, so you can see a link, um, but I think there's also links with the, the stories about the origins of the games, because both Pelops and Heracles are credited with playing a role in holding kind of the festival. So there's a sense in which um, the kind of the the sculptures work in their context, not just to one of the god, but also to remind you of what you're here to do. You're here to kind of, um, you know, take part in these games mm -hmm. in honour of Zeus. Um, and Judith Barringer has talked about the the kind of the the, the bodies of the the people involved in in the sculptures in terms of sort of thinking about how athletic bodies are represented here as well, particularly in the um, the scenes of the lapis, I think, to almost sort of offer models. Um, for the athletes who are going to compete. And of course the chariot race does that very nicely. You've got yeah. kind of a mythological chariot race and then, you know, in the Hippodrome we'd have real chariot races taking place. So. Um, so the aim of the book was really to think about kind of how does myth work, Greek myth work, when it's taken out of Greece and taken to Rome. Um, what changes are made, how do people, do the, state, the stories work in the same way or do they serve kind of different functions and different um, needs. And one of the things I was particularly, particularly interested to explore was why Greek myths are so common in Roman art when Roman myths really aren't. So things like, uh, I mean you do find Aeneas a little bit, um, and Romulus and Remus, but you don't find a lot of kind of narrative depictions of them. You, you, you'll find kind of Romulus and Remus with the street wolf. Um, but really, the majority of the scenes that you see in sort of paintings, mosaics, um, on sarcophagi as well, are things that we know from Greek myth and they've kind of come over. And so, yeah, it was to kind of explore all of the different resonances of that. Um, and one of the things I was interested in was the way that they act as role models, I think. So um, I think there's a way that myths kind of give you a prototype of human um, activity. So you've got the ideal male, the ideal female, the unideal male and the ideal. So they kind of give you things to follow or things to avoid. Um, and you can see that in the Greek period too. So you can see, um, so for example, there's a nice vase painting, the Euthymides, um, or the, well, the Euphronius vase painting where uh, one side has this scene of three revellers, but the other side has the arming of Hector um, with Priam and Hecuba either side of him. And their identities are kind of are revealed through the inscriptions, so we've got little tags that tell them who they are. Um, but if you didn't have those inscriptions, would you necessarily know it was Hector, or could it just be any Greek mm -hmm. hero? arming themselves to battle so it's sort of you know then you give a name to you have particular named heroes but they embody the the, the sort of ideals of the society more generally this idea of kind of chaos and um uh, and battle and then i guess also on that vase you've then got the dynamic between the kind of the fighting scene on one side and the revelry scene on the other so as you turn it around you sort of move from war to enjoyment of the creation <laughs> and you know sort of the two sides of kind of adult life maybe or male uh, Athenian life so yes but I think so in, in Rome um, you find this particularly in wall paintings I think uh, but often there so it's not always positive 
examples. So, for example, you quite often get like collections of, of sort of negative women, kind of um, people who've um, gone astray through various <laughs> airs of um, judgment, uh, kind of, you know, an advised love affairs or whatever it might be. Um, so, people like Medea, Fiji, etc. But then you can find people who um, are sort of rewritten in, in the, the visual, the, the artistic depictions from how they appear in the literature stuff which is really interesting um so for example dido who you know dido yeah. Aeneas four is very much a tragic queen sort of falls in love with Aeneas, kind of makes her downfall through it all the rest of it but there's a, an illustration there's a, the painting of her in the house of meliega at pompeii where she's kind of sitting on a, a very formal throne uh, she's surrounded by handmaids and you've we know it's Dido because there's a personification of Africa and there's Aeneas' ship in the, the corner, but at the same time she, she looks more like your kind of archetypal Roman matrona sort of surveying her household. So, so I think they play games as well at kind of subverting things. I think it's lots of different reasons. I think partly it's um, kind of paideia, educationally, yeah. you know, I know my myths, I, I can. And, and this fact that everybody who's got even a little bit of education knows some myths because those are what you, the stories that you're told and the, the stories you read about and all the rest of it, everyone's read some Homer. And, um, so, you know, those are the kind of part of the, the stocking trade of, of ancient education. Um, but I think it's also perhaps because Roman, in the sort of Republican period, Roman legendary figures are often very closely tied with particular elite families. And so I wonder whether they carry a bit too much baggage with them, that, you know, uh, when you move from the public to empire, you want to get away from this kind of rival patrician families sort of uh, competing with one another. And myth is almost, Greek myth is kind of safer because it's outside and you're bringing it in so it's um, it's not as tied to individual sort of uh, family politics maybe um, and I think also as the empire broadens the the population of Rome changes quite a lot as well so you've got all these new senators coming in you've got people you know from from Spain from Gaul from the east from sort of Asia Minor and so again this this idea of a common language you're kind of everybody has access to that. In Asia Minor, I would say, particularly when you find mythological scenes in the sort of second and third centuries, often they're there for um, kind of communal identity purposes, to sort of forge a link between the city or the place where they're set up and kind of link it back to mainland Greece or, or Greek culture more generally. Um, so there's a really nice example in the theatre at um, Nyssa, which is um, in Monday, Turkey, um, and they've got, a, they've got two mythological scenes. They've got the birth of Dionysus and they've got um, the rape of Persephone, um, and both of those are kind of associated with that area because in the myth, it's the nymphs of Nyssa who raised Dionysus up. Now, lots of it's got a versions of the myth that Nyssa is in India, but for the purposes of this, <laughs> it can be Nyssa in Asia Minor. You know, they're sort of obviously playing on it. And they also had um, a famous cult spot, um, the Karanaeon, which was supposed to be the entrance to the underworld, which was uh, linked to the descent of Persephone to the underworld, um, and they have a, a sacred meadow, uh, which is supposed to be the place where Persephone was kind of snatched by Hades. So so they're obviously, you know, drawing these and, and making a myth which is quite common. I mean, both of those myths you find, you know, all over the place, yeah. but they're making them very specific to them and saying, okay, actually it happened here with us. So you find this quite a bit in Pamphylia, actually, on the south coast. Um, very much heroes who are supposed to have gone wandering after the Trojan War. So Mopsus and Calchas and Rixus. There's a whole series of, um, some of them are more familiar than others. <laughs> you know, Rixus, I don't think, comes up very much otherwise at all. But there's, there's an, a gateway that was erected in the 2nd century AD by a notable lady, uh, Plancia Magna, who actually had a family 
um, links in, she was a sort of Italian family by old Germans and then they sort of moved to Asia Minor in the first century. Um, and uh, she sets up this gateway with a whole series of statues in it of these legendary founders of the city and that's very much tying it back into kind of um, pushing the credentials of the city back into yeah. the legendary past. So even though, you know, actually there doesn't seem to be the Greek site there that that's all that that goes back further than to the Hellenistic period. Um, it's they're sort of pushing it back into the kind of archaic past. Festivals are interesting. So some of them are tied to kind of long-standing traditional, you know, Olympian gods. Yeah. Um, and quite often they are ones that have been upgraded in the Roman period to kind of Isopythian status, so yeah. equal to the Pythian Games in, in Delphi or East, equal to the Olympian Games, uh, the Olympic Games in, in Ellis. So... We do find Apollo a lot uh, with all these Ethiopian games um, and of and Artemis quite a lot as well because um, she's got a sense of worship a lot there. But you do also find um, new imperial festivals. It's not always easy to disentangle whether they're festivals of the imperial cult or kind of patron deities who have had the an, an imperial title added on to them as a yeah. mark of respect and, and sometimes we maybe worry too much about disentangling them because the, the emperor sort of gets in everywhere in a way <laughs> um you know we tend to go oh, that's an imperial cult temple and that's not but actually i think the, the two are often quite yeah. enmeshed yeah. and they've still got that past i think yeah. and that maybe the the focus has changed over time and also it seems to be because looking at the festivals from Perge in particular, there seem to be two main festivals that kind of coexist for quite a while. Um, and one of them seems to be about Artemis Pagaia, and the other one seems to be about um, the kind of asulia or, or inviability of her cult. And sometimes they're sort of associated with the imperial cult, and sometimes they're not. It, it's, you know, there's a. So the. The, by the time you get to the third century, you find Asulia and Pythia as kind of titles on coins that seem to refer to these two separate festivals. But then you try to trace it back into the second century, you think, well, is this the same festival that's continuing, but it's just had a few name changes along the way? Or is it something different entirely and it's sort of stopped and it started again? You know, because we're kind of using inscriptions and coins and lots of, you know, the evidence isn't continuous. You're, you're sort yeah. of making assumptions.